Game 71 of 500 Pick Miniatures by Bill Wall. The white player's name is Hewitt, and he played someone with the black pieces by the name of Goins. This game took place in Dallas, Texas, 1983. E4, D6, D4, Knight F6. We should be familiar with the Pick's themes by now. Knight C3, G6, F3, guarding against an annoying knight G4 after the bishop comes to E3, and also using the F pawn as a uh, jumping point to push the G pawn and the H pawn, and eventually to H5, and to rip open the king side. This queen usually goes to d2 behind the bishop. White castle's queen side trades off this bishop with this dark square bishop and hopes to mate the king in a deadly attack. Let's see how the game went. c6 from Goins. Bishop e3. b5. Now, oftentimes, uh, black anticipates this plan of castling queenside and so forth and tries to get a jump start on a counterattack on the queen side. So that's why you see c6 and b5. Sometimes the queen will come to a5. This pawn will push so that this knight will be uh, moved away from the center of operations. But the downside of this is that while black is pushing these pawns he's not developing any pieces in the game and sometimes he can fall prey to a, a strong counter attack if these moves aren't timed uh, especially good so Hewitt played h3 now Bishop d3 was perfectly uh, fine here, just uh, continuing development. And say play could go bishop g7 and knight g2 and uh, castles, castles, and uh, continue on in that manner. But Hewitt was intimidated somehow by the uh, b5 push. And wanted to keep his knight right where it was. And he played a3. Of course this gives black a little bit of time to catch up in development. So black plays knight bd7. And now white strikes at this formation by playing d5. Which the main purpose is to undermine this pawn right here. For instance if uh, c takes d5. Then this pawn, this pawn will be uh, vulnerable here. But actually, in this position, it's a good move. Of course, not uh, c5 because the pawn will be hanging. But in this position, white's d5 is premature because after c takes d5, and say for instance, uh, knight takes d5, well, black can simply play a6. And the game is uh, relatively uh, equal. And another uh, example could be uh, C takes D5. And say if uh, white tries to benefit immediately by capturing the pawn on B5. Well, black can play D takes E4. And after F takes E4, say A6, and Bishop D3, we see that white has an isolated pawn, and uh, black has uh, no worries. Black has a great a great position. It's easy to figure out where the, where the pieces go. This bishop will be here on G7. This bishop will probably go to B7. Uh, 
and has a uh, easy game to look forward to. It's not lost for White, but it's not what White wants, especially beginning the game with F3 and having such aggressive intentions. So let's go back. After D5, Goins played A6 in order to maintain this pawn at B5. So D takes C6, was played. Knight E5. Now, even though Black is able to gain his pawn back, this move still constitutes a waste of time. Notice that Black is not developing. Black's moving the same piece again, and he only has two pieces uh, developed right now. So now, knight d5 is played. And I want you to keep in mind the dark squares here are also vulnerable due to the fact that these pawns have been advanced on the white squares. That's why you always have to be careful when making pawn advances because you can't take them back. And now that these pawns are advanced on a6 and b5, these dark squares are vulnerable. And notice, the knight can now jump in there as well as the bishop. So, after knight d5, black is thirsty to get his pawn back and restore material equality. But, he's forced to resign because the queen is attacked and after for instance queen d7 knight c7 check and the king has nowhere to go except into the discover zone where this knight is going to just go crazy by capturing with discover check the king's going to go back and forth and just steal everything there is to steal. For instance, back here, then the bishop's going to come in. And the only way to stop that is to give up the queen. So, the game is uh, totally lost. And that was all because of the weakness that was created. This is where the game ended, by the way, in 10 moves. Because of weakness that was created on the dark squares. So keep that in mind, whether you're playing white or black, that these common pawn moves weaken the dark squares. And always look for that opportunity. Let's go on to our next game. Okay, this is game number 72. And white is a grandmaster, Korajika. Black is G. Hollis. I'm not sure of, of his title, if he has a title. But this game was played in Islington. In 1968, the Grandmaster started off with e4, d6, d4, knight f6, knight c3, g6, f3, c6, again with the similar intention of expanding on the queen side, bishop e3, knight bd7, a4. And this is a preventative move to uh, hinder Black from uh, going through with his plan. Queen a5. And the idea here is that Black wants to force this move through. But he can't do it right now because this rook is protected and this pawn will just capture. But say after Queen d2, then the rook won't be protected. Also, this knight is pinned uh, temporarily. Usually, this move is a little more effective when uh, this pawn is on f4. And then there's a lot of pressure on the e pawn. So, after queen a5, queen d2 was played. And Hollis played h6. Now you might say, well, is it possible to play b5 right away? 
Well, it is, but there's a refutation to that. And B4. And I won't get into detail with it right now because it will show up later. So let's look at the game continuation. So, after queen a5, queen d2, a6, preparing b5, knight g e2, b5, now the idea is to exploit the unprotected nature of this rook. Here is a move by the grandmaster b4. And what this move does is it diverts the queen and now this rook which is unprotected is a liability and now white actually threatens to take this pawn I want you also to notice too that with the queen here on b4 notice the limited number of escape squares the queen has Queen is running out of places to go. There's a few squares, but it's getting it's getting a little sketchy for the queen. A black player really has to keep an eye on his queen. Let's take away some of these boxes and stuff. Okay, so queen takes b4. So just just keep that in mind that the area around the queen is getting is getting dangerous. Queen is in the wrong neighborhood and is uh, in danger of being harassed. Note at the same time, black has only two minor pieces developed. That's these two knights, and they're not doing anything, and this queen is out. So, let's just look at some unprotected pieces real quick. We have the rook here, and the queen there. So, let's keep that in mind. And, we have this tactic, since this rook is unprotected, that we can actually take this pawn here. Okay? So, A takes, and of course, black cannot capture with this pawn, because again, the rook. So, C takes B5, alright? Now, knight F4, unleashing the attack on the B pawn. Now, this is a threat, because again, the unprotected nature of the rook makes this an th uh, actual uh, threat that can happen. Bishop takes b5 so if you were black what would you do to eliminate that threat okay Hollis did what I consider a real natural looking move he played the bishop to b7 this rook solves that problem immediately because the rook is now protected and now there is no threat against the b pawn and what's great too is if white Excuse me, if black can make it to the end game, these pawns are great liability on the queen side. So, this move does a lot of things. We were talking about the lack of black's development earlier and the uh, unprotected piece. So, it looks like black did the great thing. Played bishop b7, develops a piece, puts some pressure on the center protects another piece and staves off the enemy threat you can't ask for more than that now we had mentioned earlier another problem in black's position and it was that this queen didn't really have a lot of retreat squares now before the uh, pawns were exchanged this was one of the retreat squares but after uh, a takes b5 took place because you remember this was the position and the queen this was one of the possible retreat squares but after a takes b5 right that was no longer one of one of the uh, retreat squares so now looking at the position right is black to move notice this queen has really no place to go I only see two squares for the queen to go. One is here. Yeah, actually, that's it. I only see one, one square. 
right? Let's see. Let me look. Make sure I'm not having chest blindness. Okay, so he has one square to go. So the Grandmaster attacks. Right? So now that square is covered. But since this knight is blocking this bishop, this square becomes available for the queen. So the queen goes to c4. And this has brutality written all over it because, again, discovery. You, you don't want to be have your king and queen or any piece for that matter involved in these kind of discovered uh, move situations. So basically what you're trying to do now is ask yourself, what what square can I put that knight on on d3 that is going to do the most damage to my opponent? If you can, you would like to checkmate, but there's no checkmate available. So the next best thing is, is killing the queen. And if you can't kill the queen, you want to try to win an a important piece. So the Grandmaster played knight c5. And the only uh, move that he possibly can, can go to is b4, queen b4. Notice the protector itself is not protected so this bishop came here to take care of this rook which was unprotected but it is not protected itself so it's one of those things uh, physician save thyself you know but um, you gotta read to understand that little thing right there but um, anyway just joking so black played queen take f1 queen takes f1 check and the game, for all intents and purposes, is over. Rook takes f1. D takes e5. e5 was played. Knight d5. The Grandmaster played d takes c5, although he could have just captured this knight if he wanted to. And knight takes e3. Queen takes e3. And white excuse me black resigned there so say if he didn't take the bishop and he just tried to keep going along with uh, queen b4 well just simple knight takes b7 and black is up a piece so there's some good lessons to learn in a game like that one was that you don't want to go put your queen uh, out there too early in the game because it will become vulnerable to attack and as we see I stopped it on the position where the b4 uh, pawn sacrifice was made you know and the way to think about it is with so many uh, pieces undeveloped in the position you know you know the king is still in the middle it's like you should try to take care of the important, more important things uh, first. You know, in this game, Black had his king out there, excuse me, his queen out there running around and um, and uh, pawn grabbing and then wind up getting, uh, getting trapped. And that's kind of like the story of that game is uh, just trying to be uh, too fancy and initiating this early queen side attack without being sure notice it's, pre it's presumptuous because with c6 and b5 right at a6 black did all these queenside maneuvers without really being sure if those those were necessary uh maneuvers in other words white excuse me in other words black is assuming that white is just going to castle queenside and he's just going to be castle into this ready-made pawn storm now sometimes that happens where white will castle into it anyway because he feels his attacking chances are better but uh in this game white white never even castled period nor did he even attack on the king side he just kept he just maintained the real strong center and um counter and exposed uh black on the queen side where he was trying to uh, 
initiate an early attack in the game. And one of the sins he committed was uh, ne just neglecting his pieces, neglecting the development of all of these important pieces. You know, bring the queen out real early. All the beginning chess books tell you not to do that. Don't bring your queen out early. But sometimes, you know, we feel like we're real knowledgeable and that we can, you know, we know the exceptions and all of this stuff. Like, well, we can bring the queen out here because of this and that specific thing. But I think more times than not, like when you, I, I think more times than not, you wind up being wrong. You know, like you try to find that special exception. And of course, there's always exceptions to, um, these things in chess like you can find games where people win with their king in the middle of the board and you know without castling and stuff like that you know but most of the time the the person that has a king in the middle of the board is going to be on the um the losing losing side yeah you'll have that exception where the the king is uh you know right in the middle of the board and can't be checkmated and somehow comes back to win but most of the time You'll be wrong. It's the same with uh, bringing your queen out real early. Yeah, there's going to be this, those games where you get your queen out and you're running around with the queen and you win the game. But most of the time, especially when you start playing strong players, you'll learn not, not to do that. And this is a good, good game here because you see the queen coming out real early before black even has any kind of development. And then you see the queen uh, getting victimized. Hey! Let's go on to the next game. I like these miniatures because you can learn a lot from miniatures. They're simple games and there's, there's errors in the games. And when you're first learning chess, this is one of, one of my chess secrets. When you're first learning chess, you want to start off with, with primitive, you know, I like to call them primitive, but simp like simple games, primitive games that have, have major errors. That's why it's good to study games like from... Um, Morphe and uh, Adolf Anderson and those players from the 1800s because they made some mistakes but their opponents would make a lot of mistakes and therefore you can increase your strength by by just following those games and understand and seeing those errors and seeing why certain moves aren't played in certain openings today see when you watch two top level grandmasters today you're not really seeing any mistakes. They might make one or two errors, but then the game is decided. You know, you're not you're seeing just precision and engine analysis and it's really hard to learn from those games. Like if you're if you're a, a you know, 1900 player and you're looking at, you know, say Kramnik versus Caruana, like how much are you really learning from that game? That's kind of like you being in elementary school and then you're trying to read a book on calculus. You can look at the book and you can even read, but you that doesn't mean that that you're going to turn that into some kind of comprehension. You see? So you look at those games, you look at Carlson's games, you look at Kramnik's games and you're still rated 1800 or you're still rated 1500 or 1700 and you wonder why? Because you haven't built a proper foundation. You're looking at calculus, but you haven't learned times tables, and no, and that's what those games, those games are like. Those games are like looking at differential equations, and those are you know into you know have gone far in math. Those games are looking like looking at something real complex, and you think you understand them, but you really don't. Because if you did, if you really understood, then you would be able to duplicate that the level of play, but you don't understand. You know, you only can copy. That's why a lot of players, right, everybody, there's that old saying in chess, like you start the game or everybody plays the opening like a grandmaster. But then what happens? The middle game, right, in the end of the game, the play dramatically falls off and then you find your level, whether it's 1,500, 1,800, or whatever. I suggest study study games bet between, you know, study games in the 1,800s. Study until you fully grasp that. And understand that and then then move, move up from that you know it's good to study games between amateurs study your own games you know study study a lot of amateur games so you can see the tactics and see what not to do in, in certain positions but anyway enough of that sermon let's go game number 73 
This game is between a player named Weeby. It's spelled W I B E. So we could say Wibe, maybe Wibe. And the black player name is Kaizari. This was a correspondence game from 1983. So there are no computer uh, generated moves here. Because it's 1983. And if there are computer generated moves, they're bad moves probably. So e4, d6, knight c3, a little twist on things here instead of uh, the usual d4. Knight c3 is played. g6. And here's uh, kind of like a modern defense. The knight f6 has been delayed. So now we have a modern. And now d4, knight f6, so we can say we've transposed here, f3, c6, bishop e3, knight bd7, queen d2, so we see this plan again, b5, bishop h6. Now... This is a questionable this is a questionable move right here. The reason why it's questionable is yes, do we want to trade off these bishops? Yes. Why do we want to trade off the bishops is because black has created a uh, a potential weakness by creating the fianchetto and um if we get rid of those bishops then we make the dark squares weak. And then we can use those empty holes to put our minor pieces in there. The other pieces, say like these knights, for instance. However, this move is premature because now black can just capture this bishop in one move. Instead of being at bishop G instead of being at uh using the tempo, say for instance with bishop G seven, now and then capturing, which takes two moves, and one move, black, black can capture this piece, bring the queen over here, and play b4, dislodging this knight. And the queen will be over here not doing very much because the black king has not committed to castling over on that side. So anytime you see that, my friends, you snatch this off immediately if you're playing the black pieces and you and you want to win. And now you can play a move like b4 here, which is which is respectable, or you can go with your early queen maneuver, queen a5. But here it actually has has a you know some um, validity validity to it. So let's see what happened in the game. Did Black take this opportunity? So this move is an error. Remember that if you're playing the white pieces, this move is an error because of the tempo that Black just gains by just capturing it in one step like that. Okay, so the Black player is alert and just took it. Okay. So far, so good for the black player. E5. Now, this move is is uh, is is suspicious. Uh, this count countering in the center like this uh, is is not good. One one of the reasons why is this the, again. Black should try to should try to uh, get more developed. But what it is though is this whole this structure is weak. This structure is very weak. So for instance, after White castles, now he has the rook bearing down here and threatening uh, to take here with the queen lined up here. And then after say uh, the D pawn. Uh, captures then you have these two weak pawns right here 
So this this move is inconsistent with what's going. If you're going to attack on the queen side, you should maybe reserve this a uh, uh, little while. So a better move was just probably like b4, just continuing on, or maybe queen a5. Definitely uh, premature for e5, but um, but anyway, so he played e5 and. Yep, white did what I figured he would do is this castle because now this is a threat. Because of the queen being right here and the rook being right here. You always want to try to get situations like that where the pieces are lined up in your favor like that. And if you're in this situation, it's black, you want to get off of that. Get out of that. So, queen a5, he does do it. D takes e5. D takes e5. And now you can kind of see what I'm talking about. This is it's a little weak right now. For instance, advancing this pawn would lead to the loss of this pawn. And also give access to this square. Because now that this pawn has been advanced... Now you have now these squares are vulnerable also. So a lot of weaknesses have been created by playing allowing that structure to occur after E5 and having points on D6, C6, and B5. Alright. So D takes E5. Knight H3 was played. Now b4. So this is like black's main trunk in the position. Knight b1 is played. Giving up the pawn. And remember the same thing happened in the last game. Where white was willing to part with the pawn because of the lack of development on, on the black side. So here we have. Right, all these undeveloped pieces, and the queen is out partying way over on a2 just to grab a pawn. So that has to be that has to be wrong. They just the position just doesn't look right. This pawn is weak, this pawn is weak, and white has a nice steady lead in development. So, of course, knight g5, just bringing the pieces into the game. Now, of course, black can't castle because of the queen is interfering, but I wouldn't want to castle over there anyway. Especially without that dark square bishop. And you see what I was saying earlier now about the holes in the position. But. He wants to get the rook out. So he played king e7. Okay. So now this rook can, can roam. B3 is played. Now. B3. This is a respectable move. It's not the best move, but we don't always have to find the best moves in chess. I like to move f4 personally because I like the king in the middle. And f4 is uh, threatening to open it up. Op excuse me, open up the f-file and bring the rook on the f-file after moving this bishop. But b3 has its points too. And that the queen is uh, cut off from the action. Especially on this diagonal. The queen can't can't uh, assist. So it cuts off the queen. It's going to take some time to get this queen back in the game. Okay. So knight b6 was, uh, was done. And now. White played f4. Now. Possibly knight g4. Trying to counterattack. 
might give black some hope. But after queen h5, excuse me, queen h4 with this discovered check action going on, that kind of squashes the dreams that black might have. So for instance, uh, you know, move like f6 and then white could just take just take that for example if queen excuse me if f takes g5 then queen takes g5 and then the brutality uh, begins with all these open files but I want to get back to the game okay so after 15 f4 um, black chose e takes e4 instead of this move that I was suggesting white play queen to h4 for some reason again it's not the best move but uh maybe knight f3 is better but queen h4 was played okay knight h5 was just uh this horrible move and it just allows that to take place knight takes h7 check f6 and I think somehow black was figuring that he would he was gonna win like trap this knight somehow because if you look at it how's the knight getting out right the rook is here ready ready to eat up the knight this knight is guarding this pawn along with the king so it looks like a slick move but we talked about in previous videos about attacking from inferior positions. And if you look at Black's position, it is just a mess. It looks like it looks like somebody picked up the pieces and just threw them on the board. Or like when you walk in the chess club and you just see a random board like with pieces, you know, like of games played like days before. That's what Black's position looks like. So after f6, knight takes f6. And you already see the refutation because if knight takes, this rook is unprotected. And we always talk about unprotected pieces. So, he has to resort to more gimmicks. So now black plays g5. Well, what, what does that do? Absolutely nothing. But what it does do is it distracts black it just takes white off the same file as the rook so now the knight will be able to capture so let's see what happens and let's see if it works since it's a good creative move but it's gonna prove to be inadequate so okay and notice now this knight is free to capture and the rook is not in danger so let's see what happens does it work knight takes f6 of course it doesn't work because queen to g7 check and you pick up the rook anyway and this is how inferior positions always work out when the other player plays correctly see because a lot of times and this is a good lesson is you'll you'll have winning positions in your games and you'll 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 be winning and then your your opponent will be resisting and putting up like these moves that that are kind of like puzzles and you're like man I would checkmate him but he has this piece here or I would be able to win the queen but he has this piece guarding this over here and a lot of times a lot of times many times to take this as a general rule usually there's some kind of back breaking move that will refute the whole idea of your opponent because if he's in a bad position your position is bad. I know that sounds redundant. But if he's in a bad position, the position is bad. And there's usually, there's no no miracle move that that's all of a sudden is going to restore his position to being good again. The only way that can happen is if you overlook something. And we see that in this game that Black had a bad position and was trying to basically make something out of nothing. And I like this move right here, this F6, because it just 
you know, you just look and it's like, oh man, say you've been conducting this attack, and you're like, ah, oh, my, now my knight is trapped, you know. But you just look a little further and see the defects in the position, unprotected, undeveloped, undeveloped, awkwardly placed, exposed in the middle, non-factor in the position, non-factor. When you look at all all of those things, you know that your position has to be good now to be honest white has some you know some problems here too but what's great about his position open file right here attack from that piece attack from that piece on f6 the potential of this bishop to go on these light squares if it needs to right maybe here this rook coming here here so white's pieces are going to get into the game a lot faster the only bad piece we could say that white really has is this knight here which is kind of on defensive duty keeping the queen from uh checking right there but uh after f6 it's just a nice move to find and then black again resisting because your opponents will resist finds this move because he realizes hey if i just take I'll lose the rook right here. So he plays g5 as a distraction. And now he says, I'm safe now, I'm good. But the laws of chess say, no, you're not good. You win. Therefore, that miniature at 20 moves, black resigned. Okay. Game 74. This is from a grandmaster. Westerinen with the white pieces versus Sandor with the black pieces. And this game was played in Beaverwick, 1967. E4, D6, D4, Knight F6, Knight C3, G6, F3. Bishop g7, Bishop e3, c6, Bishop c4. So we see a different uh, idea than we've seen before. d5, just hitting, hitting the bishop. That's one of the downsides of bringing the bishop to c4 is that it does, you see that in a lot of openings too, whether it's the bishop's opening, whether it's um, uh, Gioco Piano, uh, some lines of the two knights uh, defense is this bishop being on c4 vulnerable to a d5 uh, move. So bishop b3. D takes e4. Queen d2. Now here we see the grandmaster uh Engaging in this speculative gambit. This is a gambit now because he doesn't, he's not trying to capture that pawn. His idea is hey, black will take here and he'll gain time and plus have these two open files and he'll castle queen side. Okay, so that's the idea. Sandor plays knight d5. He probably would like to trade this knight's bishop off here. And black, black is, is standing good here. Black is, is good. But still have to play the game out. Because now black black has like a decent... Uh, black is up a pawn, of course. And he has a nice nice presence in the center. So black is definitely more than equalized. Um, it's easy to place his pieces too. A knight here. Castle. You know. Uh, maybe, maybe bishop to e7, perhaps. Or e6. I'm not sure where to, where to put this bishop yet, but definitely like knight c6, castle. Um, black has black has definitely has a good game here. So he's up a pawn. So he finally gives in. He takes and d takes e4. 
So again, no complaints, Black. This guy Sandor, I don't know who he is, but he's playing very good against a, a Grand Master. And I think Western, Western, and might have been an uh, international master at the time. I'm not sure in '67. I would have to look that up. But nevertheless, he's a very strong uh, player, and Black is holding his own. And what's good about this move is kind of uh, having the pawn is kind of annoying because it keeps his knight from going to his natural natural square here. Okay, so ninety two castle castle so far so good and just for the record let's say black is better and moves are real easy to play too knight c6. We have pressure right here. White plays a3. And bishop g4. Remember we were like, where are we going to put this bishop? Now that the position is clarified a little bit. The bishop comes out to a respectable square. And it's easy to see. You know, say like rook c8. Uh, maybe this queen will go on c7. And then this other rook here. So basically... Um, Black just has to just has to play good good moves from here on out, and would uh, maintain a nice advantage. Let's see what happened. C3. So we can see now White is playing like solid moves. White is worse, but he's playing playing solid, which is uh, he understands that he doesn't have any big advantage in this position, so he's just playing nice solid moves. And this is what a lot of GMs do to amateur players too. Is uh, or master players due to like uh, weaker players is that the position will be dead even you know quote unquote theoretically but that doesn't mean anything because just because in in the, in a book or some computer analysis says okay this position is equal after move 15 well you still have to play the rest of the game out and that's when those, those your human abilities come in and you make errors and your understanding of the position you know will show up you know and the stronger player usually will be able to outplay somebody that's weaker, even though the position is theoretically uh, drawn. So c3, e5. So, so far, black is hitting on all cylinders. These are all great moves that's that's being played. So what does the, what does, uh, the grandmaster do? Right? He sees he's going down. So what does he do? He muddies the waters. He muddies up the waters. He plays rook, takes f7. Right? Rook takes. And the idea, of course, was that, hey, I'll get the piece back. I'll just pin it again. So at the rook f1. Now... Black might have been in shock from this move, but he probably could have just played a simple move, bishop f5, and then say after bishop takes, king takes, g4, e takes, And he would have been uh, slightly better. He would still have been better. King, uh, King safety would have been dealt with, but he still has a, a, a slight uh, positional advantage here. He's up a pawn, and his king is not in immediate danger, and some pieces have been traded off. But. I think this player Sandor, he did he did like a natural he, he did a uh, you know what could be considered a natural looking move. You know he probably was in a little shock, and he said, you know what, let me just trade down. So he plays bishop takes e2. But then, after this, this justifies White's play, and now. Black is lost 
Can you believe it? And the reason why is because of the discover the uh, discover check. So now we have discover check opportunity versus the king. The rook is on the seventh rank. Pawn on b7 is unprotected. And plus, this piece is going to be recaptured. So just like that, one mistake, one mistake due to the not reacting correctly to a speculative sacrifice in black is in all sorts of trouble. He does what anybody would do. He's king h8. Right? Now, does western in just take the b pawn? Is that important? That is that even an important factor in the, this type of position? You see, that's the thing. Like that's the difference between strong players and weak players. Like a lot of players would snap, snatch up that B pawn, but is that is that really where it's at right now in this position? Think about it. You know what's going on? The king has just moved. You have rook on the seventh. You have the dark square bishop there, right? This piece is out. And you kind of got black on the ropes a little bit. So you got to be looking. How can I increase the pain on this person? Bishop h6. Now you're threatening just to win the piece outright. And then if he takes in, you're threatening. After the queen comes in, now you're threatening checkmate after that. He does what I think any normal person would do. Bishop f6. Western in play queen takes e2 finally getting the piece back But now his position is just overwhelming He plays bishop e7 And he and he uh, collapses because after bishop g7 the game was over and black resigned And that was just um, uh, amazing game to me when I first saw it because It just shows how quick the tides can turn in the game I mean black was doing black was just doing fine just cruising just cruising along black was just cruising cruising along here you know after uh, let's see the castles castles here nice e6 a3 and it looked like white is playing nice and quietly c3 e5 and then he made this speculative sacrifice and he and black wasn't able to find the right continuation that the rook takes excuse me okay so like i was saying um so just just by just by missing that one move the whole entire whole entire game uh was was uh was shifted and that shows that you have to you have to just maintain focus the entire game but i have to give uh uh black credit too because uh just the fact that he had that position against a, a very a very strong uh player um to blow is as impressive itself especially with the black pieces but at the end uh, uh, Western in, uh stepped up and he realized that that might be his only chance to create those complications and then black went wrong in those complications game 75 white is H Bell black is instead and this game took place in Oregon in 1980 so e4 d6 D4, Knight F6, Knight C3, G6, F3 again, Bishop G7, Bishop E3. By now we should know these plans in our sleep. C6, Queen D2, Knight BD7, and Bishop D3. Finally, right? Bring out this Bishop. We haven't seen this move yet. We usually see uh, Knight uh, G E2 first. Now this bishop is out. B5. Knight H3. Castle. B6. 
bishop h6. e5. Now this is a strong, this e5 here is strong. I complained about it in another game a couple of games ago because I was talking about the, the weakness of, of this structure. Now the thing here is that since black, excuse me, white has played h5, he's left this, te left this temporarily uh, unprotected. And therefore it seizes the opportunity to attack this and, and try to take the the initiative. So after d5, again now trying to undermine this pawn, b4, knight e2, c takes d5. So we see black has taken the initiative with his weak with with his weak pawns. Now he has to turn that initiative into some type of a concrete advantage. Or these, all these pawns will end up as weaknesses later on. So bishop takes g7, king takes g7. So white has wasted some time to gain this objective of, of, of trading off this bishop. But if you notice, this piece is a little awkward right here. Black is castled and a little bit better developed than he has been in the past. And he has a nice mass of central pawns. C file is partially open. It has some feelings. Uh, some uh, reminds me of a Sicilian a little bit. So let's see what happened. So after King takes G7, Queen takes B4. Now, Black has, for the course of that pawn, two more open files. And by the way, this pawn is also under attack. So D takes, F takes, right? You had this backward pawn here. Rook B8. He goes for it. Queen D6. Now you already should notice that there's something terribly wrong, and this time it's with White's position. He's 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 running around with the queen. Remember we talked about development, and and there's more important things that can can be can be done. He's running, running around with the queen while while black is developing pieces. Let's see what happened. Right after rook b8, queen takes d6. Queen a5, check. Now black brings his queen out. But it's to assault the enemy king. King f2. Hold a minute. That's a new word. Hold a minute. How about, wait a minute, right? What happens if natural move like c3? Well, this rook takes b2. And this is a liability. And the same thing would happen if this knight came here. It would be worse because after rook b2, and this pawn, excuse me, this piece is just hanging. So, king f2, rook takes b2. We had the rook on the 7th rank. White pieces are all discombobulated and uncoordinated. This pawn is threatened, so we see a desperate looking move, a4. Now is a fantastic move, knight c5, right? Putting pressure here, but again, that pawn is irrelevant. Nobody cares about this pawn in this position. We want this guy. We want the king. So the real threat is knight takes e4 here, right? Can you see it? Let me get rid of that second arrow. The knight c knight c5. The threat here is to capture twice here. Because you see the distance and position of the king and queen at the knight takes, bishop takes, and this other knight takes, you have a fork. You pick that queen up. So that's the real threat. We're not worried about this pawn right here. So knight c5 is played. King f3. Now this is a bad day when the king 
the 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 highest ranking person in the army has to go and and hold up a lowly pawn on the front lines. King is on the front lines right now while the two rooks are just back here. Basically they might if, if the chessboard was bigger, these rooks would run away. They would be off, they would go, they would retreat. They would just be the kind of soldiers that flee. But the test board only had 64 squares, so they just stay as far away from the battle as they could. Meanwhile, the king is so brave and doesn't want to get forked. But you should be able to see this guy right here just waiting to meet the king. So the king is brave, though, because he just came up to meet his executors. Bishop G4, king G3, and do I have to show you the end? Because you still have this fork. And you got a knight takes e4. And of course, after bishop takes, there will be another fork. And white, uh, excuse me, black resigned. So even though I showed you a lot of games, I'm just following the order of the book. There's a lot of times where white wins and times where black wins. Of course, white wins more, more often in this opening. But that was a game to show you how black uh, can turn the tides. Okay, 76. Game 76 with the white pieces a player named Stevenson versus Kabalek with the black pieces. This game is from Illinois, 1991. So E4, D6, D4, Knight F6, Knight C3, G6, F3, Bishop G7. Bishop e3, castle. Bishop c4. I like queen d2 better, by the way, instead of putting the bishop there. I already explained to you about the vulnerability of the bishop on this square. Okay, c6. As it's vulnerable to this as well as that. But that doesn't mean it's a bad move. It's just my preference. Bishop b3. Here we come with the pawns on the queen side. G4. A5. So now that the bishop is here, white has to take time to protect it. So this is a good move because it's a defensive move and that it protects the bishop, but it's also an offensive move. It attacks this pawn right here. B4. Knight C E2. Knight bd7, knight g3, e5, g5, knight e8, h4, Now, I just want to make a, a quick note that although it looks like white is, uh, you know, has has like a great position to some people, it's really, its position is really not that good. This, look at his pieces. Pieces are, are not not really, not really too, too well coordinated right now. This bishop is just hitting the back of this pawn. So... Why have the bishop there if you're going to do that with your pawns? But um, this bishop is, is probably the best piece for white right now. And again, it's just not, not coordinated too good. But this can look intimidating. Meanwhile, black, at this point, especially with the white king in the middle, black should be shooting, shooting to open this up. Should be trying to open, open, the, uh, open the center up. You know, open the center and then get the knight to c5 you know perhaps trade this bishop off and then uh perhaps play c5 like you should definitely be trying to open open the game up here so he plays c5 d takes c5 And let's see. 
I play bishop b7 which something is wrong here okay let's go back I just just spotted this myself okay here's the problem now c5 great idea the execution the execution is flawed so he has to he has to play saying like a move like knight c5 first or something like that you want to play c5 you want to open up the position i was saying even play this move uh i'm sorry after uh let me see where are we 12 because this move was yeah, after 12g5, 98h4, I was suggesting a move like that, which is a great move. Just open up, start opening up the position on uh, on the on white. Instead, black played this move c5, and the problem with it is the idea is good, the execution is faulty because, of course. Um, if white plays a move like d5, he just kills his pieces, kills this bishop right here by cutting it off. So you get a better look at it. That's just a horrible. That's just a horrible move right there. So now this bishop would be cut off, and this bishop would be cut off. And so white's playing c. Excuse me, black's playing c5 with the idea that hey, play that, and then he'll get the knight in. You know, some attacking moves. Unfortunately, this move does not work because after bishop takes, again, taking this bad bishop that was behind this pawn, trading off for the knight, and voila, look at this. The queen is unprotected because of this move, 98. Cuts off the coordination between these two pieces. And that's why that move is tactically, tac tactically flawed. C5 was incorrect there because... The queen is vulnerable. So after d takes c5, I'm assuming black realized, oh, I made a mistake. And is just trying to go on without it. But now the tables have turned into white's favor, in white's favor. So rook a6 desperately trying to make something, you know, make uh, lem lemonade out of lemons, right? Trying to you know rectify the situation. Five. Rook d six, right? Recapturing the pawn. Looks respectable because you know he's got his rook on the file. Only problem is is that with that little loss of time there, is that one. Black is down a pawn. In case we get to the end game, and two, White's kingside advance has advanced a little bit far further than it was. So, 17 after Queen e2, Black made an error and just captured that pawn for some reason. So, G takes H5 was played. And then, White just mopped up with uh, Queen H2, threatening uh, Queen H5. And now he's forced to uh, go into sacrifice mode. G takes F6, Knight takes F6. And a theme we've seen before. Dark square weakness. And Bishop C5 was played. And White resigned. I cannot explain to you, ladies and gentlemen, why Black uh, chose to play this move. I mean, he was in, in trouble anyway, but any move like Knight C7 or something like that, and let, let, uh, you know, let White work hard to get over there. I guess he figured that if he allowed White to take, that this, this, um, file will be wide open so he figured that if he takes maybe he can um muddy up the file with the you know pawns and pieces on it and stuff like that but it just didn't uh it just didn't materialize
Okay. Let's go on. Let's keep it moving. All right. Um, where we at? Game 77. We got three more to go. Okay. This game, white player is fuller. The player with the black piece's name is Irie. This game was played in Whitby, England, 1956. Or D6, D4, Knight F6, Knight C3, E6. Look at that, something different. That's all stodgy defense right here. Knight F3, G6, Bishop G5. You know, got this threat going on here. Bishop e7. Queen d2. Knight bd7. Castle. a6. Intending on some kind of queen side demonstration. But the problem is that it is way, way, way too slow. For white to even flinch. And he just uh, plays e5. Knight h5. Now he trades bishops, which is definitely a strategic desire in a lot of, of these openings. But I like bishop uh, h6 too. g4 was played. Now the knight has to go back to g7. This is a horrible position for black if he did not notice. Queen h6 attacking the knight. There are only two moves that can be made. Maybe rook here. Actually rook rook to g, g8 can be played but he will drop, drop this pawn. The king can uh, come over. It's just terrible looking moves. Black played f6. So he figured he would attack the center at the same time and protect with the queen so bishop d3 was played the idea is to take there with check and expose this unprotected rook so knight f8 using the knight to uh, take care of everything but there's a there's an error here. Ninety four was played. Now instead of ninety four, it's good to keep piling up, piling up. But um, there's real simple moves that can be done too, like queen uh, e takes f six and queen takes f six, followed by just rook to e one. Just establishing dominating position like that. You know, I say, hey, what about that knight? Well, if uh, queen takes f3, then you got queen takes g7. Attacking this rook. So remember, the superior, uh, the superior uh, side and force uh, usually has tactics working in favor and I always say usually because somebody always has some obscure game where the side that was uh, you know with the worst position of undeveloped was able to deliver checkmate or something like that but I tell you eight out of ten times nine out of ten times that the tactics will be in the favor of the side with the superior development and the superior overall position my friends all right, so e takes f6 was not played, but it is a good game, and also it adheres to the principle of hey, when you're ahead in development, open up the position, and and we can see here that white is fully developed, so those moves are screaming to be played, but he played knight e knight e4, which is a good move too. It threatens. You know, sometimes they say the threat is more stronger than the execution, right? So, 94 is a strong move and also winning. Now, we were just saying that the 
side that is uh, ahead in development, right, should strive to open the position. Why? Because the logic behind that is very simple, is that if you're ahead in development, you want the position to be open so that your pieces can really shine in the position, right? For rooks and bishops to shine, they need open files, open diagonals. If you have a closed position, the rook and bishops can't do anything. That's why knights are better in closed positions because knights are the only piece that can hop over a wall of pawns and hop around. And knights can knights can get by in a closed position. Bishops and rooks find it very difficult, and queens too, for that matter. But anyway, we were just saying that the side that is ahead in development and has a superior position should strive to open up the position. So. Right, so the the opposite of that is that the side that is behind the development, right, should be striving to keep the position closed, right, so that they so that they're not as vulnerable to attack, or so that while the position is closed, they have the time to catch up in development. So, under if you understand that, then you know that this move by Black right here, D takes E5, is suspect. Because he's opening up the position. He's opening up the position for white's pieces, right? Right, for white's pieces, but with no development. So that can only benefit the enemy. So what happened? Of course, D takes. Right, so now this whole file is opened up <laughs> for, for whites. Who's benefiting from that? Like, why would you do a move to benefit your opponent like that? Unless you and him are like real good friends or something, or you and her, or unless she promised you a date or something like that, and now you're like, okay, I'll open this file, and you'll beat me, and then we'll go to McDonald's, you know, wherever, Burger King, whatever you eat, you know, um, you know, a Chinese restaurant or whatever. So... So, after D takes E5, now, Black snaps out of it. And he said, oh, I got to keep, now he's playing, now he's using a different plan. Now he's like, oh, I got to keep the position closed. So, he opened it over here. He opened it on this, on the, on the D file. But over here, he said, oh, I got to keep it closed. So, this is a play of my friends that's in shock. Of course, Knight F6, check, right? This, this is what you call an outpost. Knight, knight is just sitting there like a rock. This is real hard. This is real hard for for anybody to deal with. You never want your opponent to have a a strong outpost like that. So he goes to king d8. Now let's just show you that real quick. That's mate. In case you didn't see that king, if he goes to f7, that's just mate with the knights. So, he goes to D8, and what do we have here? Discover Central. Right? Discover Channel. Whatever you want to call it. Discovery Zoo. Anything. Discovery. Just remember, whatever it takes for you to remember these things. That's why I'm saying all this weird stuff like Discovery Channel. Because what's going to happen? You're going to be sitting down in one of your tournament games over the board. And somebody's going to walk into a potential discovery situation and you're gonna in your mind is gonna say discovery channel and you're gonna have to thank me for that you're gonna be like you know what I'm gonna subscribe to this guy's channel cause he said discovery channel and I just won you know 30 bucks for first prize under 1600 in my chess section today so that's it <laughs> so alright so anyway king d8 so we see the rook is here king is here that's great for white and we see who's benefiting from opening up the position. And what move can we do? There's a few devastating moves here. I mean, we could take here, right? The bishop. But what's the best? What What's the object of the game? The object of the game is checkmate, right? So. This is what was chosen during the game. Bishop b5, check. The king can't move. The knight The knight's guarding this square. Rook's guard in that square. So, it's time for Black to start giving up some pieces. Plays that. And 
bishop takes d7 is played and there's no there's really no way out here these scar these squares are covered if he takes with the knight right he tries to capture with the knight this rook is going to come with double check and the queen will be lost so the only move in the world really is c6 you know that way the king could get out uh on a dark square but then then after c6 you just play a move like queen g5 with the discovered uh theme against the queen so for instance the idea is uh i'm just gonna try to waste waste the move somehow okay there's a wasted move right so and i'm sorry i messed that up i didn't want to do that one i did say for instance king c7 I mean, there's a lot of moves you could do here, but for instance, you would have this move with a check right here, sacrifice the knight, and the queen is gone. So if he goes back with the king, then you just, you know, you just scoop him up. Okay, so that was that was a fun that was a fun game. Okay, let's go to game 78. This is uh, a white player named Gizdavu versus. A black player named Ozturk. And this game was from Bulgaria. Bulgaria. 1973. E4. D6. Stay with me. Only two more to go. Knight F6. Knight C3. G6. Knight F3. C5. And this is a, a line that you see every now and then this early c5 and you say hey wait a minute can you just take and uh, trade queens and that's and you can't castle and it's good for white and blah 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 and then he puts e5 well it doesn't quite work like that but needless to say that here the c5 is premature and you're gonna see why c5 is a line in, in the pick but it happens it happens uh, later at proper time c5 usually you usually you'll see it uh after bishop g7 is played and such but we're gonna and you and especially in a uh like uh not yugoslav attack but uh you know like three pawns attack and stuff like that so after knight f3 where are we yeah c5 was played this is an error, and you can win the game real, real quick like this. So, for instance, D takes right, and let me just show you the knight, uh, queen a5 was played in the game. And the idea is a similar idea in in uh, other pyrrhic structures. Like again, here it's wrong; it's 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 too premature. But the idea is to put pressure on this knight right here, pinning the knight to the king, and then to pressure uh, this pawn and then say after a move like bishop d3 then then white would uh then black would just recapture his pawn with a nice pawn structure open c file and stuff like that and it's and this play reminds you of the sicilian dragon a little bit but again here it's it's uh incorrect uh and also if D takes C5, this is like the most primitive part of it. Queen takes, King takes, Bishop E3. You're attacking this, playing on Castle and the Queen side, and you just have a great position at the King. King here, you play a move like H3, prevent the Knight from bouncing here and here. Um, And then just white, white is just better here. Nice, to, nice lead and development. Um, let's see, h6. Just making up some moves. King b1. Knight c6. And that's what I wanted to play is e5. Knight d7. Right, looks like he's gonna do something with that. Right, we just keep threatening. And let's see, for instance, if he took there, right? Check. Uh, 
and that's just an example. But black, but white has a, a nice, nice flowing. You know, and those are just some moves I, you know, made up. But those are white has a nice flowing uh, initiative there. So that's why D takes C5 is never played uh, by black. It's played by white, but not by black. Okay. So after D takes C5, Queen A5 occurred. And in spite of what I told you before about this being pinned and this pawn is in danger, here white just takes. Because I told you in this line it's premature. So knight takes e4. So it looks like, hey, it looks like white is falling into a trap. What to do? Well, the problem is unprotected peace. Unprotected peace. But you might say, hey, I have tactical vision. If he does queen d4, I'll just jump back with the knight. And that's probably what what Black was thinking too. That's why this move c5 is not played early. This bishop is always here to defend against that. Right? So queen d4, knight f6. Okay, you've seen that far. Right? It looks like you've, you know, you've won the e-pawn. You've won the e-pawn for, uh... You know, for nothing. So, the white player played right after that. He didn't capture a pawn or anything. He just played knight e5. Now, he had a stronger move at his disposal. Instead of playing knight e5, just play bishop b5 check. And for example, bishop d7, bishop takes, knight takes, bishop f4, say queen c5 with the idea to trade off queens, castle, you let him, queen takes, rook takes. And uh, let's see, knight h5. Let's see, he tries to get rid, of, get rid of the bishop. And again, you just keep it moving. And you have all this pressure here. And it's hard for black to complete his development. So, after even this move. Right? After all of that. Uh, black is still lost. So let's go back. So instead of uh, doing bishop b5 check, he played knight, knight to e5. Okay, knight e5. Knight c6. All right, looking natural. Took that, and then he played bishop f4. It's difficult for black to deal with this pawn like this. And as you'll see, that's the essence of this whole situation. And now if he wants to bring the bishop here, and you take the pawn, right? And then if he takes the pawn, you bring your bishop in, into the mix. And then he doesn't want to play a move like that. Weaken that structure and cause this guy to be in trouble. So it kind of creates an awkward situation there. He can't really take this pawn because of the vulnerability of the knight. He can't push the pawn because of the same reason. And he can't bring his bishop to g7. So that's when you see that c5 played before this bishop come here, that's what you, you gotta you remember that. That I did. Bishop be 6 So you see white or uh, black trying to develop around the pawn. Castle. Castle. Okay. Bishop c4. Finally. Bishop g7. Right. 
take a big sigh of relief. But now, after bishop takes e6, check, f takes e6. Queen c4. We see that black's in a lot of trouble. Just to get out of that situation, he's, he's taking on a lot of weakness. And look at his pawn structure. It's terrible. Capablanca would just go crazy. He would malfunction because they say he was a chess machine. He would just start malfunctioning if he had a pawn structure like this. I mean, you have no winning chances. And the thing that's crazy about this position is sometime at least you have a pawn structure like this, but you have, like, say, uh, a overwhelming amount of activity with your pieces or something to compensate. In this case, black has nothing. White is more active and has a better pawn structure, right? And there's not, and it's, you know, it's just a terrible, terrible position. Terrible, terrible position uh, with black, and I can't emphasize that enough. Queen c4. So after queen c4, finally, e takes d6 was played, right? He straightens out the pawns, but now the king comes under duress. Right, and of course, look at this. Bishop takes d6. This this just hurts the feelings, you know. Moves like that because it looks like you could take, but then, you know, just stiff moves coming in, and that's those are those those are those perks of having a superior position. When you have a superior position, you can look look for those kind of moves, you know, like that, you know. You look for them kind of moves that just like, you know, just smack the opponent around. Like, hey, what you what you going to do now? You know, like take that. You know, that that's one of those kind of like take that. Like you want to capture, but you can't. You know, somehow this guy has this, the strength not to resign. I would just resign. Bishop e5. Rook h f8. Still looking for opportunities. He played king b1. And then uh, this move, bishop h6, has two question marks. Can you tell why? What did white? What did white do to uh, end the game here? Can you see it? You can pause the video. Well, you probably won't pause the video, so I'm gonna tell you. But <laughs> rook takes d8, right? Real simple move, right? Deflecting, distracting, whatever word, enticing, whatever word you want to use. Getting the rook away from defending the poor knight on f6. The knight is telling the bishop, hey, I didn't do anything. Why you want to mess with me? And the bishop says, I know. I'm just doing my job. So, White wins that game. So, but what's the main lesson to take out of that game? Of course, don't get, you know, enter in a terrible pawn position like that. But, it's just the fact that this move is premature. When this bishop, then this is for black. Don't play c5 here unless this bishop is already here. c5, just remember that. Even though you might not remember the lines and stuff, that's not important. Just know that c5 is wrong to play right there at that point. It's just it's it's wrong. There's no there's no uh, saving the position. There's no putting it through the computer and the computer finds some special move for you to play. Don't play it unless you plan on uh, losing the game. Get that bishop to c5 first because that pawn will be very very annoying as we saw because there's a, a similar theme in the pyrrhic. And we'll see that at a later time as we go through these miniatures. But right here, it's it's not uh, it's not um, it's not working. And again, just remember this, this, and this. This pawn is a thorn, and the reason why is because of vulnerability of this knight. See, at the e6, and put the arrow there. At the e6, the knight can be captured after e takes d6 the knight can be captured and then also recognize after after um, for instance 
bishop g7 so for instance after this move so after say after bishop g7 he said hey I'll develop now the problem is now what you know the king is all all stuck alone it's stuck out there alone you know what is he going to do and this is a brutal position you don't want to you don't want to uh you know start off a tournament with this position so just remember those two themes about that okay game 79 okay we have a player with the white pieces by the name of Pova and on the black side we have Grandmaster John Nunn from England this game was played in England 1977 my question is was John Nunn a Grandmaster in 1977 or was he an international master or just a fide master? Okay. E4, John Nunn. Play D6, D4, G6, modern. Bishop G7, Knight F3, Knight F6, Bishop C4. We have some classical, classical setup going on. So. After bishop c4, knight c6 is played. Ideas put pressure here. No, h3 to stop that. Castle. Queen e2. I just want to mark out this is a uh, game is probably equal right now. I haven't haven't uh, looked too deep into it, but notice the. Oh, Excuse me, the phone just rang. All right, back again. Sorry about that little interruption. That's what happens uh, when you don't have the high falutin studio time. You know, you just at just at home doing the videos. But power to the people, and hopefully you get the substance. So Queenie two, and I did Queenie two is to enforce e5 here so black has to be black has to be uh, aware of that also what is queen e2 uh, doing well let's let me go back a little bit another drawback of having a bishop on this square is that is a tactic here whereby knight takes e4 and you'll see this in several other openings again as we discussed before like the Gioco piano and d5 and as you can see here uh, Black hasn't won the game or anything, but white white center has been uh, totally annihilated at this at this point. Well, of course, this then this would be taken. Uh, so this is what this is what black wants to do. This is the whole concept and idea behind any of these modern or so-called hyper modern openings is allow white to occupy the center early with pawns, and then show and prove that they are unsustainable and weak by destroying them. And is and that is exactly the point in that variation right there so that's another uh, another point that you have to remember when playing the move bishop c4 however in this instance white plays h3 here again I was showing you to keep the bishop from pinning this knight on g4 right to the queen and thus making this vulnerable because the idea is to uh, is to capture this knight and say queen takes then then the knight would take here the only other alternative then would be to allow double pawns and ruin the pawn structure which uh, white doesn't want to allow therefore he plays the move h3 now h3 does you know cost a little time right so now Black, if he wanted, could he could play this move, and the game would still be equal. But sometimes players don't prefer this particular variation. For instance, instead of just taking with the knight here, Black, uh, excuse me, White could play Bishop takes F7, King takes F7, 
and knight takes e4 and the game is still good for good for black don't get don't get me uh, don't get me wrong but some players feel less comfortable in that situation where the king is kind of you know exposed a little bit so here so even though none had that option here he chose to play he chose he chose just to uh ignore ignore that opportunity or bypass that opportunity in castle first now he's threatening it and he doesn't have to worry about that because when bishop takes then just rook takes you know so here for instance let's let's uh let's use like a no move here like a3 or something right so now see this works fine you could just play knight takes e4 and I have to worry about this bishop here because uh, uh, the king is safe so so he waits to do it so now it's a now it's a legitimate threat of knight takes e4 now white could come back if he wants to which again will cost a little more time he could even strike at this um, strike at this this knight here by playing d5. But often this play is to move just queen e2, which neutralizes again the threat of uh, uh, knight takes here. But now white not only neutralizes that threat, but he makes one of his own, and that's playing e5. Therefore, black plays e5 first white plays d takes e5 d takes e5 castle and right now we have uh, pretty much even you know even chess game right here knight d4 we see the occupation of the d4 square right which is a big uh a big important uh, theme in these openings. White decided on queen d3. And now there's a threat to e5. Knight d7. Making sure e5 is taken care of. White plays a4. That move looks kind of suspect. Um, expanding on the queen side. Uh, for what exactly? Maybe to bring this bishop back to a2. Preserve the bishop here. It just doesn't seem like a like a constructive move. It seems like a move that. Okay, you resign yourself to the fact that black is equalized, and now you're just looking for just solid moves to play so black is a-okay here at this point knight c5 attacking the queen queen goes to d1 c6 black takes care of this problem right so no pieces can use this square however d6 is weakened Okay, white plays b3. Okay, now knight c e6. And notice the skillful domination of this d4 square with these maneuvers. Knight c5, e6. And all these uh, pieces are in harmony and coordinated with each other. So beautiful, beautiful thing to watch. Excuse me, messed that up. Beautiful thing to watch these strong players coordinate the pieces all of these pieces just influencing d4 like that knight b1 white doesn't appreciate the beauty as much and wants to play c3 to knock that the to knock that house down so queen f6 so now we have a little threat here and the threat is basically to double up double up the pawns here 
right? To make this capture. Then this becomes weak for a later uh, attack from this bishop. White says no. Knight h2 and maybe with ideas of coming to g4. So now... Look how he's just using these outposts. Beautiful. It's John Nunn right here, Grandmaster. So finally, Black says, okay. A white says, I'm going to play C3. He plays it. So he sw he switches the focus off of D4, and now he's on F4. And now it's really difficult to remove the knight from F4 because this pawn is weak. Now remember, H3 was played in, in earlier in the game. Move six. Now it's a liability. Okay. So moving on. After C3, knight D E6. White finally played his plan of G4. Queen H4. Now the pieces are starting to hover around the, around the king. And then there's possible ideas of kicking this knight out, right? With moves like h5 and such. Knight d2 was played. Possibly, right? With a real obvious idea of playing the knight to f3 and harassing the queen. So, none brings another piece in. First of all, putting pressure there. And preempting a knight move uh, coming there. Also, there's an additional threat on this pawn. Look how many pieces are on, on this pawn right here. So, white plays f3. Now here, your spidey sense should be tingling as mine was when I first looked at the game. Look at the dark squares. And look at the king. And if you were able to draw. Right. Imaginary line. Right. If you were able to draw a line. In the middle of the D and E files. And count all the pieces on this side. Right. You will see. White only has two pieces. Defending on the king side in the midst of all these weakened uh, dark squares we already mentioned this h3 move earlier how it's become a liability so John Nunn simply played knight g takes h3 check remember this is cut off the queen has these squares blocked Right now, if he moves anywhere, if the king moves here to h1 or g2, what do we have again? Queen is here, we have discover channel. Boom! And we're at least gonna win the queen. It's probably mate, but I, I'm not even going into all of that. I just know that we can win the queen right away. Right? So now, if he makes the capture, the queen just simply comes right in. That's the maiden square right there. There's no escape. So, always look for weaknesses. When you see, especially when you see all the pawns on one one color complex, you have to you have to uh, keep that in mind. In this case, it's on the, it's just on the king side. You see a bunch of pawns on the on the light squares, and you notice the dark squares are weak. And you see where the dark square bishop is inactive the dark square bishop is on strike and chose not to participate in the protection of these dark squares and therefore the dark squares are just vulnerable and that and that's what happens this queen is able to end up here now in contrast let's get rid of some some arrows make the sack again a nice check by the way now in contrast look at black's position right he has on this king side he has three pawns on the light squares. What does that mean? That means that since these pawns are on light squares, 
that the dark squares and let me take away take away the uh these dark squares are weak for black so what's the difference the difference is that black is able to maintain because of the dark square bishop is there holding the fort down he's saying hey i may i'm making these weaknesses but i have a piece here that's gonna that's gonna take care of that right see in other words this knight ha can't ha can't access these squares because they're being guarded properly by the bishop the knight would love to go there and post up but he can't the queen is also guarding this square and that's what you have to understand when you if you do make pawn weaknesses like that you have to have so, something to compensate th that weakness you can't just have a weakness without anything to compensate so here in this case look at black look at white's position in contrast the dark squares are weak but there's no protection just on on its own okay last game hope you like that one that was a good game and john nunn is one of my one of my favorite players I like looking at John Nunn's games. Okay, last game. This is number 80. This game is Winter with the White Pieces versus a player named Skulls. And this game was played in East Germany, 1970. So E4, D6, D4, Knight F6, Knight C3, G6, Knight F3, Bishop G7, Bishop C4, C6, A4, the fight is over this square, white is merely preventing queenside expansion from black, knight A6, and sometimes uh, this move knight A6 is interesting, it's a flexible move, of course, there's an old saying, knight on the rim is grim, or knight on the rim is dim and all that stuff. And basically, yeah, if you keep your knight here the whole game, it's, it's a bad piece because it doesn't have as many squares uh, as options to go to in the center. But usually, when this these type of moves are played in the opening, it's because the knight is going to bounce back here to c7 or c5 and sometimes to b4. If you notice, the committal pawn move a4 is made to stop, to stop the b pawn advance. So now this square b4 is is weak, and sometimes the knight will anchor in b4, followed by moves in a5 and stuff like that. And you'll see that in a lot of different openings too, like Dutch defense. You'll see it in um, Slav, where the knight comes to a4. As a matter of fact, the Smith's law variation of the Slav defense, the knight will come to a, the, uh, I'm sorry, a6, and then b4, because this square has been weakened and then anchor itself there and just be a nuisance the whole game and I'm not saying that's gonna happen in this game but that those are ideas that come along with it of course the game is young and this night can go different places but the point I'm making is that the night is never meant to just stay there like that if it stays there usually something went wrong so castle castle queen e2 remember what I told you about this push Queen a5. Again, see, just now it was a perfect opportunity for knight b4 to be played. Steady so played queen a5. And it seems like we're going through the same situation as we had in previous games where black will try to exploit the unprotected nature of this piece and force b5 in somehow. So. Uh, queen e2, queen a5, bishop d2, threatening some kind of discovery. You'll see this setup too in a lot of uh, Scandinavian, the Scandinavian opening. Uh, after uh, the queen goes to a5, you'll see like d4 played and then bishop to d2. And eventually the knight will hop to uh, d5, the queen will be forced back, and then the knight will capture on f6. So again, a lot of themes are transferable in chess, so it's good to learn as much as you can. And don't worry about the opening so much, but learn the, the themes. So bishop d2, right? So nobody wants to be involved in discovery central, so he goes to queen h5. 
right? Remember, I was telling you that this move in combination with this wants to play e5, so black becomes worse because he allows he allows e5 to to be played. Knight g4, and uh, black is hoping that he has enough pressure against this square to make a change, to make some difference, to make an impact. So knight e4 is played. Now here, uh, is, is uh, h3 could be played, but I like this move. Knight, this this kind of like destroys black's dream because there's no need to make it put in a liability. Notice in the last game h3 was played here. It's no need. If you don't need to play it, don't play it. Knight e4 is a strong move because it threatens it threatens this right here. And it's also threatening the move knight g3. Because if you look at one of the features of the position, the queen the queen is tucked itself away here and it now doesn't have too many squares to escape to. And that's one of the downsides again, as we discussed earlier, that the queen you just can't you just can't uh just think you could bring the queen any anywhere without being harassed. So at the ninety four He goes to knight h6. Hoping to create some loft for the king, you know. But the problem is, is uh, well, what about this? What about material, you know? So e takes. Bishop g4. D takes. Rook f8. And this bishop takes h6. And the game is uh, just, just brutal right now. For some reason, rook takes e7 was played. Bishop takes g7. King takes g7. And here is the star move of the game. It's knight g3 hitting that, allowing that. Remember, attacking from an and attacking from a superior position, the tactics are going to be in your favor. You see? And this is one of those cases. Black's, posi Black's position is definitely worse. And therefore, the tactics fall into white's favor. So, after rook takes e2, knight takes h5, check. Bishop takes Bishop takes e2. Finally, what happened to this guy? What was his his future? It, it was so bright. Finally, gets to b4. He should have been there like 15 moves ago. Just c3, and uh, he resigned. He's just down material. That's brutal. He's just down a piece. Just down exchange. Ever just down. He's just down a whole rook. He's down a rook and a pawn. So he just resigned. So again, in that game, it just show you not what not to do with your knight. Don't put your knight on a6 and just leave it there. The knight is supposed to, if you put your knight on a6, he's supposed to move shortly after that to see whether it's c5, whether it's c7, the b4. It's not supposed to be there the whole game like it was that game. Uh, Black resigned by the way at the move 19. Um, also, another lesson from that game. Is uh, is e5 allowing e4? Be careful when if you're black, you got to be careful when this with this point allowing e5. Sometimes you can't allow e5, and then you're able to mount up enough pressure against the pawn, like playing moves like knight g4 and stuff like that. And obviously, that's what um, that's what uh, black was thinking here, you know. You know, you got you figure you got the pawn, you got the knight, the queen, the bishop all lined up, and uh, you know you figure you figure everything's you know everything's gonna be all good, but um, you know you figure you're gonna destroy the center, but this queen is in a bad spot. 
this queen this queen should be protect somewhere protected. You know, like maybe like on Queen on C seven or something. You know, we're still pressuring the center, but it's just not in danger, and that's what happens. This knight comes to E4, and now it's in danger. You know, endangers the queen now. To, you know, by coming there. Notice where the white queen is. The white queen is is active in the center, but far enough away to where it's not in danger. And that's kind of like what what kind of tilts the uh, the game right there. Is this queen coming from A5 to to um, H5? You know, so after this move, um, you know, things rapidly slide downhill. So, because E5 is definitely a dangerous move. Like, if you allow E5, you definitely should, if you're black and allow E5, you definitely should have some type of refutation, you know, to, um, to count, counteract, you know, and I, and, uh, even if white had took here, he's still better. It's just that uh, bad. This bad piece pl placement. After e, after e takes d6, you know, there's h3, and um, I mean, the only way the queen should be here, I guess, if you're gonna mate. But maybe he thought he was gonna get some kind of this is knight was gonna disappear somehow, and he would get mate. But um, but anyway, that's it for now. So that was a lot of fun. I need to drink some water now, and um, that was another ten game. So in the next video, you know, when I do uh, pick miniatures again, we're gonna start with game eighty-one. So I see y'all later.